a lot of the reasons why shame exists is because of ignorance and lack of knowledge. How can you um, debunk the myths that exist within society and feel unashamed when you don't know the bare basics of what menstruation is, how the menstrual cycle works, or even be able to say the words vagina, tampon, menstruation? Half of the world's population does, had, or will have a period. But we spend most of our lives pretending or hiding that we do. And even when we do talk about it, we use silly names like Auntie Flo, Time of the Month, Red Wedding. We're made to feel so ashamed about something so natural that there are over 5,000 slang terms for period. Generations of women have been conditioned to believe that their periods are disgusting or shameful, which has massive consequences for our bodies, our healthcare decisions, our sex lives, and of course, our overall well-being. Around the world, menstruation is framed as a problem to be hidden rather than a healthy bodily process. The menstrual cycle has enabled pretty much every single person on earth to be born. If you don't already follow Bloody Good Period on Instagram, then let that be the first thing you do after watching this episode. I found them on Insta when I was looking to learn more about period shame and poverty, and they've worked with more than 100 organisations around England and Wales, helping more women and people who menstruate have bloody good periods. Welcome to Terry, the Education and Comms Manager. Hi, so Hi. bloody excited to be here. We're bloody excited <laughs> to have you. This is great. So uh, let's get down to the bloody basics of language. What do we need to do to normalise periods? Because they happen whether we talk about them or not, but somehow we've spent all of our lives being embarrassed about them, trying to hide them and, and be ashamed about them. Yeah, I mean, it's completely normal to be shamed and embarrassed of our periods. The whole of society is telling us to do that from advertisements that until 2019 had blue blood instead of red blood to those huge hazardous waste bins that you see when you go into the bathroom. Society mm -hmm. is telling us that this is something to be ashamed of and secretive. Um, and so that's what's stopping us normalizing periods. One of our advisors, Claire Hutchinson's to our Bloody Good Employers Program calls this the concentric cycle of shame and a silence which kind of sounds quite big but basically just means that because nobody is talking about periods they don't get spoken about and so the basics of it is let's get rid of um, shame and eradicate it and that's what we're all about at bloody good period um, if people want to do that at home they can kind of follow the foundations of our organization um, which are to educate to normalize and to campaign because those three things are what's going to change conversations um, we like to think about it in terms of what another one of our advisors, Dr. Sally King calls a weak taboo. So um, once you start talking about periods, everybody wants to talk about them. So yes. really they're not that shameful um, because everybody just wants the opportunity to have that conversation. And we really see that through our education program where we offer a space to learn and discuss periods. And um, once a silent room then becomes full of chitter chatter of period stories of leaking. And so those kind of space to talk about those are really, really important. Um, and education is really key there. A lot of the reasons why shame exists is because of ignorance and lack of knowledge. How can you um, debunk the myths that exist within society and feel unashamed when you don't know the bare basics of what menstruation is, how the menstrual cycle works, or even be able to say the words vagina, tampon, menstruation. So education is really key there. Um, and yeah, in terms of creating that safe space, it's all about normalization. So talking openly about periods, um, opening that space. And we have a resource called Mind Your Bloody Language, which is all about that. It's all about taking everyday terms that we use, like, oh, she must be on her period or period pain isn't that difficult. Um, and yeah, 
re reforming that to make yeah. it more accessible for everybody and just to open up those conversations i think that's really key and finally um campaigning so one of our big and ongoing campaigns is to have free period products for everybody in the uk um well done to scotland who have already done this um but yeah we think that's really important not just because everybody should have free and accessible rights to period products but because that would normalize periods if you saw yeah. period products everywhere around you um then you'd feel more open and able to talk about them so yeah let's let's normalize it by just talking freely about them <laughs> yeah i i i mean it's, it's brilliant to hear that and i love how you've sort of um, blocked that out into those three different pillars if you like um but it's true it's like it's like the elephant in the room and that's and that's really what courage is contagious is all about it's about being courageous about having these conversations about things that we know exist and i've certainly found that once someone's courageous enough to start the conversation, then that bubble is burst, Absolutely. and everyone and everyone um, and you know is almost like over enthusiastic about talking about it. And we need men. We need men to talk about periods too, and to recognise periods as well. So um, let's talk about the really upsetting topic of period poverty. Uh, now I read on your website that over her lifetime, a woman or a person who men menstruates will spend nearly five thousand pounds on period products which is actually a financial penalty that men don't have. Yeah. And women, as we know, there's the gender pay gap. We earn less than men over our lifetimes. Um, and you told me this morning that WaterAid said that in the UK, so there's not a developing country, in the UK, a third of people who menstruate are worried that they won't be able to afford period products in the future. A third, I mean, that's massive. Huge stuff. And of course, those who experience period poverty, they're more likely to report moderate to severe depression, They'll skip school, they'll skip work. Um, and of course, that will hold us back in the workplace. It's going to impact our potential to succeed. So talk to us a bit about period poverty and what we can actually do about it. Yeah, so I think... Firstly, that £5,000 is just for period products itself. That yeah. doesn't take into account the extra costs of menstruating. So paracetamol, um, pay, paracetamol yeah. if you leak in your underwear, the yeah. cost of cleaning things using a washing machine and things like that. So actually the cost over a lifetime is much, much greater. Yeah, of course. I think what's really telling from that water aid stat is that this isn't just an issue for people in poverty. It's becoming an issue for many, many people across the UK. And we're really seeing that in in our work we've seen an almost 80 percent increase in requests for products and we've wow. also seen requests from um large corporations from nhs trusts from government-backed um pro programs and projects and so this need is only widening as um the living crisis kind of um gets wider and i think the issue around period poverty is not just around a lack of a lack of product, but it's also all of the things that come with it. So um, we know from our partners that not having products um, creates stress, mm. anxiety, isolation, all of these things, people unable to leave their home for fear of leaking, um, and then on top of that, there is the added burden of um, using other products. So the same water aid report showed that one in five people were using alternative methods to, um, yeah, to collect their period blood. So whether that be toilet paper or sponges, um, and that has health consequences course, as well. Yeah. And so I think when we live in a world that is set up for the male majority, as we do, um, that these things aren't thought about and they're yeah they're not included in the space and so I always think that if um if people who menstruated uh if the world was created for us there would be period products everywhere and there would be facilities for us to change and use those things but period poverty has far wider implications than just access of products um it's health it's well-being yeah and as you said it's your um your engagement and ability in to, society yeah to be yeah, in society let alone, let alone at work or in education yeah yeah i mean it's um it does make your blood run cold doesn't it that that it's 2022 and we've got a third of people worried that they're not going to be able to have access to the products that they need 100%. yeah um so that's that point is about what how periods can impact uh people in the workplace so let's talk about that workplace recognition so when I'm trying to sort of uh, facilitate conversations about this at work, and, and it's really important that we bring men with us on the journey rather than make them feel like they're on the outside looking in and, and that they're somehow 
um, you know, not not welcome to have a seat at the table and have the conversation. I often say, imagine how different the workplace would be if it was men who got periods every month of their career. You know, it wouldn't be awkward and embarrassing at all. It would be equated with power and virility. Oh my God, you did that presentation, you're on your period. You smashed it, that's amazing. Um, and, you know, as you said, period products would be a basic human right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I sort of, again, sometimes joke with my team, we don't talk about um, period pain when we're looking at evaluating how someone was reviewed during their during their assessment. But yet someone who comes to work every month with, with really bad period pain, you know, they're going through something that is causing a physical pain and a mental load that other colleagues aren't having to. So what do we need to do to get workplaces to acknowledge, to uh, register and recognise periods, but also the shame and the stigma, but also how to accommodate and allow for it. Yeah, everything you've just said is exactly the reason why we created our Bloody Good Employers Programme. Um, so I would really urge everybody who's kind of interested in this to go and check out our website. And you're coming our... to speak to us at Meta. Yes, exactly. Um, it's very exciting. We've got some incredible launch partners. So, um, But the basis of the Bloody Good Employers Programme um, was from a survey that we did with over 3,000 people. And it showed some really shocking statistics. Um, so the majority of people who menstruate felt stressed and anxious about being on their period at work. Mm. But I think the, the stat that really affects me the most is that 25% of people felt that taking time off for menstrual health issues or just menstruation in general would affect their career progression. Yeah. So what you've said there about, yeah, it having an impact on you is so true. And I think when I talked about the world kind of being set up for the majority of people who don't menstruate, um, that's around the fact that, yeah, society builds in this 24 hour clock. Um, and the more we've kind of become productive and part of the rat race, that 24 hour clock has become the standard. But people who menstruate, their bodies don't work like that. They work in a 24, 28 day cycle. Um, and at different points across that cycle, they might feel more productive, more yeah. energetic. Um, and that has an implication on the kind of person they bring to work. So I think when we're talking about menstrual health in the workplace. It's not about something revolutionary and having to create this whole new sector around menstrual health, but it's just basic equality, diversity and inclusion. And yeah. um, it's meeting the needs of the people that work for you and who work around you. And that's at the very heart of what we do in the Bloody Good Employers Programme. Yeah. And you've got lots of assets, haven't you, on your website that if someone wants to talk to their HR department or their employer about this, they can sort of go in with, with armed with some information, which I think is, is helpful if people don't quite know, want to do something, but don't quite know where to start. Yeah, I really think the Bloody Good Employers website is the perfect start point for that. We kind of frame everything in a way that's really easy to communicate to your employers or employees. And we've just launched this um, period product guide, which is all about delivering period products to your employees in a way that's inclusive, comfortable, and really speaks to the needs of the people that work for you. So I would check that out. <laughs> Brilliant. So that's actually a great um, segue on the inclusivity point, because I think there's a, a growing recognition about period shame, isn't there? I think this, we're still on a journey and there's a way to go. But I'm also quite conscious that the conversations that are happening, and obviously it's great that they are, tend to be more exclusively centered around cisgendered women. So women who were born and identify as women. So help us understand what we need to be, what we need to do to be more inclusive for gender fluid um, and non-binary people. Yeah, I think this is something that's at the very heart of what we do at Bloody Good Period. And it's something that from our foundation, we noticed was missing in the menstrual health space. But we have a phrase that we like to use, which is not all women menstruate and not all people who menstruate are women. And I'll kind of break that into two. So the first part being that not all women menstruate. There are many reasons why someone who um, was born and identified as female will not menstruate. It might be stress, contraception pregnancy, menopause, but that doesn't make them less of a woman. And then there's the second part, which is not all people menstruate. So anybody who was born with female reproductive organs or a uterus has the ability to menstruate. They might not identify as a woman, they might um, identify as non-binary or any other gender identity, but they still menstruate. And so we need to think about their needs when we're developing programs and policies. And this is really important for employers because often a quick win is to deliver 
a period product, but if you put them only in female um female only spaces or bathrooms, it means that people who identify in a different way will not be able to access that or um, feel that they can speak about that. So that's really important. And I think on the note of inclusivity, we always think about gender when we're talking mm. about inclusivity, but there are many other layers of that within the menstrual health space, specifically race. So we know that black people and people of color are more affected by menstrual health conditions. And also um, the stigma attached to PMS is often um, yeah, more connected to like black women and the way that they are seen in society. So that's a really important point. And also to speak to disability as well, um, that people with disabilities um, find accessing period products a lot more difficult and, and delivering that in the workplace is really important. So I really think we need to take an intersectional approach when we're dealing with periods in the workplace. And again, just thinking about how do we meet the needs of everybody um, who is in our workspace? <laughs> yeah, God, there's a, you know, there's a lot to think about and a lot to unpack there. And I, I've certainly learned quite a lot in the last couple of minutes. So I'm sure, I'm sure lots of people who were, who were watching this will have done as well. Um, so last question before we, I mean, we could talk about this for hours. I know we could, but what, what do colleagues, particularly those who don't have periods, what do they need to know and do differently? What's the one thing if we could get them to do one specific action? What would it be? I think just learn. Um, yeah, as we said at the beginning, that shame comes from silence, but the silence is often so fueled by an ignorance or a lack of knowledge. And so whether you menstruate or not, um, learn. Everybody's experience of menstruation is completely different. No two menstrual cycles or periods are the same. So even if you menstruate, your experience is not the same as someone else's. And you may make judgments about that person's uh, yeah, ability to work or other things because you don't understand their period. So learn, read up on things, especially on menstrual health conditions, but on the menstrual cycle as well. Um, the more education we have, the more conversations we have, and then the more normalization of periods we have. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. Amazing. Terry, thank you so much. I'm 50 years old. I've been menstruating all my life. I'm now menopausal, so I don't anymore. But I've learned more about periods in the last 15 minutes <laughs> than I did do in the last 50 years. Um, so I'm sure that everyone else watching will have done as well. Um, I quite often get asked who my favourite feminist is. My favourite feminist, or one of them, I've got many, um, is Ginger Rogers, because she did everything Fred Astaire did, but backwards and in high heels. And this, for me, is so like women in the workplace. We have to do everything men do in uncomfortable shoes, battling all that bias and also whilst bleeding. I'm convinced the workplace and workplace recognition really would be so different if men got their periods. We'd probably be given paid time off every 28 days. Period shame and stigma has somehow become this white noise that we're just supposed to smile and put up with. But really, we need a world where no one feels that they have to tuck a tampon up their sleeve when heading to the loo in the office and where conversations around periods are normalised. We need a world where charities like Bloody Good Period shouldn't exist because everyone who menstruates has access to the products that they need. Only the strong can be vulnerable and courage can be so bloody contagious. So bloody well join in the conversation now and let's work together to create a more inclusive workplace for us all. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. <laughs>